West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver A new reporting today that reveals that, believe it or not, and I know you'll believe it, there's more. More classified documents in the ex-president's possession, this time at a Trump storage unit in Florida. The news only adds to what we know about the ex-president's relentless and vast efforts to keep documents that do not belong to him. It comes even after his lawyer signed a statement declaring there were no classified documents left. And even after the high profile FBI search of Mar-a-Lago found that not to be the case. From the Washington Post reporting, they were first to report on these documents, quote, lawyers for former President Trump found at least two items marked classified after an outside team hired by Trump searched a storage unit in West Palm Beach, Florida, used by the former president. That's according to people familiar with the matter. Those items were immediately turned over to the FBI, according to those people. The search was one of at least three searches conducted by an outside team of his properties for classified materials in recent weeks after they were pressed by a federal judge to attest that they have fully complied with the May grand jury subpoena to turn over all materials bearing classified markings. Joining us now, one of the reporters who broke that story, Jackie Alamany, Washington Post congressional investigations reporter, also an MSNBC contributor. Mary and Michael are still with us. Jackie, uh, most Americans are digging through storage units and drawers looking for gloves and winter hats and Christmas decorations. Donald Trump's lawyers are looking for state secrets. Take us through your reporting. Yeah, Nicole, uh, this unusual um, set of circumstances between the uh, Justice Department, the Trump legal team, and the D.C. Uh, Circuit Court ultimately culminated in these searches conducted by an outside firm that was hired by Trump's lawyers after a judge ordered them to fully comply with the May subpoena that the Department of Justice originally issued in order to try to get back these classified documents that they knew were in the possession of former President Donald Trump. Uh, uh, this came after prosecutors and, and um, Jay Bratt, he is the head of counterintelligence who has been really running point up until Jack Smith's appointment on the investigation, had consistently repeated their concerns that the former president had yet to return all of these classified documents and that they were worried uh, that that the search for the documents wasn't near done as as diligently as they would have liked um, that ended up with again the the uh, pre the former president's legal team hiring this firm. They first conducted a search uh, at Bedminster. They attested to Judge Howell that they didn't find any documents there. They then conducted an additional search during the week of Thanksgiving at Trump Tower. And the most recent search being um, the search of this storage facility unit in Palm Beach, uh, where they found two 
documents uh, to items rather with classified markings, immediately return them to the Justice Department, um, but does, I think, sort of capture the, the mistrust here and the breakdown of trust between prosecutors and the Trump legal team as they, they seek to get to the bottom of this and ensure that uh, the Trump legal team is fully complying with all these court orders. I mean, Michael Steele, it seems that you'll never get that. I mean, Trump has confessed to almost all aspects of the crime. He's confessed to taking the documents, to not classifying them, and to saying they're mine, I'm keeping them. I, I mean, the, the, the whole, I, I wonder what you think of the asymmetry of American law enforcement trying to get back something that Trump thinks is his. Of course there's more. There's probably stuff shoved in his sock drawer, too. Uh, and you're talking about the stuff that's stuffed in a sock drawer. I'm talking about the stuff that's in the hands of our adversaries that he's already Maybe. given to people, yeah. that he's already, you know, I mean, that's not outside the realm of possibility, if not probability here. Uh, I, this whole narrative from the very moment this story uh, broke, uh, culminating uh, to this point in, in Jackie's reporting, just tells you um, how beneath the surface of all of this, you have the law enforcement uh, feature, you have the Justice Department, you have lawyers all doing their thing. Uh, and Donald Trump beneath the surface just going along and saying, these are mine, I can do what I want with them. And there's no matter how much you tell him that's not the case, he doesn't believe it, nor does he accept it. So that means, to me at least, there needs to be probably a more aggressive and broader uh, uh, review of what the possible uh, storage places are, not just at Mar-a-Lago, in, in his New York uh, place, the place here uh, in, in Virginia, um, uh, wherever Trump may, may have laid his head, you're bound to find a document or two at this point. So I, I think all of this just tells us that there's more going on here. There's going to be more discoveries. Um, and, and unless those documents have already been uh, dispensed with in some form or fashion, um, it, it really begs the question, what on earth made you think you would keep these documents in the first place? Why did you think you need them? Um, and the only logical conclusion one can come to is, well, you had other plans for these documents, and, and that's going to require a whole nother level of conversation uh, and discovery once we figure out that we've got everything, if we ever get everything. Mary, um, I think there was a sense because this court approved search happened right at the end of the summer's public hearings for the January 6th Select Committee, where their intention was to put into the public arena all the evidence of Trump's criminality, culpability and state of mind in terms of plotting to overturn the results of an election he lost. And this investigation was always presented as far more straightforward. What does it say that they're still looking? What, what does it indicate about the phase of the investigation that they're still dealing with Trump's legal team and still looking for classified material. Yeah, well, I think, you know, remember, ever since the beginning, there's been two pieces of this. There's been the criminal investigation uh, to just, you know, determine whether there's evidence sufficient to establish an actual espionage, espionage Act violation for the mishandling of classified information or obstruction of an investigation. Um, but there's also been the intelligence review. And I think that, you know, what this shows mm. is there is a continued nervousness among our national security officials that they have tabs on all the potential classified information that may be improperly stored or, as Michael said, potentially even, you know, be in the hands of adversaries. Um, now, I don't have anything, you know, we haven't seen evidence of that yet, but I think when we still see the Justice Department coming back to the court and the court they're coming back to is the chief judge here in the District of Columbia where, it, where that subpoena, that May subpoena was issued by a grand jury here in the District of Columbia. This is is not uh, a judge in Florida, when the Justice Department keeps coming back and asking her to press the Trump team to look more and to look more, and she is pressing them, to me that signals concern among our national security you know, uh, infrastructure that they are worried about where other documents might be. And so I think they're really trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, and of course, that could also lead to additional evidence of the criminal charges, but that that uh, they just can't be certain that they have gotten everything. 
And Mary, is it is it I mean, I that makes a whole lot of sense as part of the National Security Review. And there's now been enough time to perhaps pick up chatter from places and, and ask questions about where certain information comes from. And we don't know what we don't know on that front. But on the obstruction front, it's it's very clear that the lawyers now, I think it's Christina Bob who had some exposure for attesting to not having any classified documents. I mean, is, is some of this building out or further probing the obstruction case as well? I think it certainly is, right? And it remains to be seen sort of what level of knowledge about what was in the storage unit, you know, um, who, who had what level of knowledge about what was in the storage unit. So clearly if uh, GSA was involved with, uh, that's the General Service Administration, a branch of the government, was involved with Trump's people in, in, in you know, renting the storage unit for there to be certain uh, documents from, uh, I think it was from an office in Virginia, um, you know, that leads one to think, okay, well, why was there ever anything in a cl- any classified information in an office of Virginia to right. begin with, right? Classified information has to be specially handled. And we know, I mean, we've now known for a long time that that former President Trump, you know, completely disregarded all of the carefully crafted, uh, you know, laws and regulations applicable to our national defense and our national secrets and classified information. And, you know, we know he was aware of it. There's no way you could could be the president and not be aware of it. We also know that his attorneys told him about it, yet still we see documents that apparently used to be in some office in Virginia, had no business being there, and now are in some storage unit in Florida. So I think, yes, I think a piece of this will also be what what did he or those within his his orbit know about this uh, and, and what was intentional and was any of this done, you know, intentionally to obstruct? You know, that's unclear at this point. Mm-hmm. I also think that, you know, you know, Bob has, as you said, has got some culpability. And this firm that was hired, I would think they'd be trying to be very, very careful uh, yeah. about w- how they do their search, right? Um, so that they don't get themselves uh, into a into legal jeopardy as well. It is Thursday, the 8th of December of 2022. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Well, uh, some great news. And uh, that great news, I'm sure you've heard, is Brittany Griner has been released in a prisoner swap that uh, apparently uh, uh, the pundits and right wing, too, are up in arms because it is just so unfair. And that uh, prisoner swap included Victor Boot. And we all know him as the Merchant of Death. And you're going to be hearing that a lot now, aren't you? Merchant of Death. Yeah, even had a movie about it. Anyway, uh, I just want to make it clear that even if Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner were released together for boot, it would still be uh, not a good exchange because boot is that bad. But Russia is in a hot war with a country we are pretty much arming. Let's be clear about that. So a diplomatic miracle indeed. I think uh, Blinken and Joe need to have a lot of credit uh, directed their way. And we're going to hear a lot about, uh, you know, it's just so terrible. I mean, she was she was only caught vaping and Victor Boot is the merchant of death. And Well, you know. You get the uh, the deal you can get. Sometimes you just got to put the cards down and take what you can get. And I think that we got a pretty good deal all in all. Bear with me. The Whalen family issued one of the most gracious statements in a situation like this that I could not only ever imagine, but uh, I've never really experienced it. I don't think the Whalen family pretty much came out and said, Joe did what he had to do and we're behind him 100%. Pretty much. I'm paraphrasing. Okay. And they issued it on Fox of all places. And, um, 
which tells me that there's going to be another one-on-one swap, and uh, Paul Whelan is going to be part of that, obviously, is where I'm getting at. You know, Russia made these, like, insane uh, demands to get both of them out. They wanted uh, like another another guy somewhere that we claim uh, we don't have this guy that you're saying that you want released. And they also wanted a prisoner being held in Germany. Like we can just say, hey, release that guy over there that you have whole, being held in Germany. Which makes me kind of think that maybe we're working on that right now. But the the person that just they pulled out of a hat. You know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, well, I think, wouldn't it have been in uh, Die Hard? Yeah, the, the, the Die Hard Christmas movie where uh, where old Hans Gruber says that he wanted prisoners from the Red, uh, the Red Paisley Gr- uh, Brigade or whatever. And it's just something he made up, you know. And uh, the feds and everybody are running around. LAPD, apparently LAPD could just, you know, say, oh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and let you uh, release the uh, Red Plaid, Red Paisley Brigade. The Red Paisley Brigade. I, I just pulled that out of my head. But they're running around trying to figure out what they're talking about. Red Paisley, great. Somebody asked Hans Gruber, Where, where'd you come up with that? Says, I don't know. I read I read something in the... In the uh, uh, lifestyle section of the L.A. Times. I don't know. Whatever. But um, so that that uh, demand from Russia that they wanted somebody that we who, who are you talking about? We don't have anybody like that. So uh, who knows? Maybe we are working on uh, with, with the German authorities right now to get this guy that they have held and who knows i don't i i i don't know so much about the person that they want over in germany but this is just you know what we're hearing uh you know a little back channel whatever through state and other places you know so no corroboration truly upon that but that's what you know that's what the uh the chatter is about you pick up chatter Okay, so uh, we do have a story coming up in the uh, Bistro Cafe about the New York Times uh, strike. So don't go to the New York Times today. They're under a 24-hour uh, uh, walkout. And uh, don't go to their digital sites. Uh, you know, None of us would cross a picket line, so just look at that digital picket line right there. Don't cross it. All right. We can do without the paper of record. For a 24-hour period. And you know what? It actually feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, almost. Uh, I heard, and it's just it seems like it. I don't know. Maybe I have some confirmation bias. Maybe. But uh, apparently the, the, uh, the stats confirm that it looks like Elon Musk and his crew are purging Twitter of liberals. Wow, that's a great business decision. Look at all the other sites that they just wanted to pack in with right-wing voices. And what the hell happened? It imploded. It's a cesspool. And what happens in a cesspool? It just sucks out all the air of everything. Yeah, that's a moneymaker. Even though advertisers are coming back to advertise on Twitter. I get Well, hate does sell. We got to admit that. But it certainly changes the whole idea about that bulletin board down there, you know, down there at the city square where we could tack things up and people could, you know, take a little tab and come back later and leave a little notes back. Yeah. It's where, uh, you know, if there's going to be a sale at the Grange. Had a little announcement about that. Yeah. Dress shop in town. Hey, yeah, we got some East Coast dresses back here. Look at all these things. Straight from Barry. And, uh, no, I guess they're going to change that. Yeah. So I guess it's all part of a whole. You have these rich billionaires pretty much 
tech types, or at least they they grifted their way into that. And others, you know, you, you the, the way you become like that is, uh, you know, a blood emerald air. You get a leg up to get a leg up. You have to. Have you ever heard of a great golfer that wasn't born into a rich family? They got a leg up to be able to play all they wanted. How many caddies made it through? They had to work all the time. They couldn't play golf all the time. Where did that come from? I might have been watching the Golf Channel by mistake. Might I have? It just always helps to have a leg up to get a leg up when you're trying to pretty much get rid of representative democracy around the world. And it sure sure does seem like that is what is going on. So one way you affect that is, I guess, you go after critical infrastructure. We have a story up here in the Northwest, and I heard about this uh, when it happened in November, and I was curious why I didn't get more press, but there have, and I didn't know the totals, but there have been a total of five, five substations attacked in a similar fashion as that that was uh, back there in North Carolina. And... Uh, uh, they are being investigated by the FBI, and uh, somebody, I, I think they're keeping it quiet because it's an ongoing type thing, five in, you know, the Northwest here, mostly in Washington, but still, we get enough uh, outages around here, I always wonder, yeah, do we have these, like, Looney Tune Oath Keeper types, because they're here, and Proud Boys as well. And I wouldn't even doubt there are hooded KKK types. It sure seems like there are. They're not wearing their hoods all the time, but I bet they go into some holla and burn their crosses. You don't want to cross them. I don't care. And I never have cared. Come at me. <laughs> yeah. Put a target on yourself that you may they may oblige you. So now I can't run uh, faster than anyone. Or anything, and I mean that. Uh, so I might as well just keep my mouth shut in those situations, will I? I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, we have enough of them, and uh, yeah, getting back to the billionaires that you know, it always helps to have a leg up. You know, to get a leg up. Uh, the the attacks on substations are they practice? Could be practice could also be just the type of psyops that is expected in these situations now, isn't it? And at the same time, we have an uptick. These are all these are all tabulated, codified uh, by uh, the appropriate statisticians, by the way. I'm not just making this up like, oh, it sure feels like it. It, it feels like it. And it is proven out by the numbers. Uh, there is like a 600% or is it 6,000? Some incredible number, an uptick in attacks on actual synagogues or other, uh, you know, Jewish bookstores, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where's that coming from? Hmm. I wonder. So, uh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's all just a bunch of lone wolves who come from the same ideological mindset of authoritarian goose-stepping Nazism. Sure seems like it to me. Uh, well, what are you going to do about it? They sure were able to bust a bunch of Quakers in their 80s planning an anti-war protest. You would think that they could figure out what the hell is going on with all these right-wing dare I say, fascist organizations trying to overthrow the United States of America, and that is their stated goal. Not to protest a war. They want to overthrow, represent not just the United States of America, but representative democracy around the world. And so... Gets us back to Brittany Griner now, doesn't it? Why did the black lady get released before the white guy? The white guy was there a lot longer. This is just so unfair. 
And they're going to play that up in their little chat rooms of hate. They're going to have that in their churches of hate, which reminds me, I'd like a, I'd like to have a separation of church and hate. I try all these uh, little uh, uh, memes and stuff on on social media. So if you if you've seen that, hey. That's what comedians do. They just keep saying the same joke night after night after night, thinking they have a different audience. (laughs) Yeah, how many comedians have a long, long marriages? You can only take a joke for so long. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. Well, have we burned up a lot of time? Well, I guess we have. <laughs> so maybe we should get back into a little bit of order. Uh, yes. And uh, attend to the actual curated part of the show that we have curated, especially for you guys out there. Well, of course, we have found out that more stolen classified documents have been discovered this time at a Trump storage unit in Florida. Now, his his excuse will be, I didn't. I have no idea, you know, paper on the floor got put into a box with my wrestling gear and my swords and what the hell? Yeah, he purloined all this stuff because he wants to sell it to the highest bidder. And I have the same concern. I had the same concern when this story broke. What hostile foreign power has our stuff? That's what I'd like to know. On the rest of the menu, as I mentioned earlier, for the first time in over 40 years, hundreds of New York Times journalists and workers walked off the job. Albeit for only 24 hours, but still. The first ever U.S. auction of leases to develop commercial-scale floating wind farms in the waters off the West Coast attracted... $757 million in winning bids. And the Pentagon will split its $9 billion cloud contract among four companies. Not just one. They're going to do it with all four now. All four? Is that all there is? After the break, we move to the chef's table where... South Korea widened its back-to-work orders on striking truckers. And Greece slammed Turkey's repeated threats of war. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the left is the link to our Patreon page. And uh, please do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and help us pay our bills because it will keep us on the air as we have been for quite a long while, and we thank you very much for your generosity in allowing us to do so. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter while we still can, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And it's a stealth campaign probably to stay on Twitter, but we're there till the bitter end. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter while you still can. uh, At Justice Putnam. Of course, you know that I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And you can find those show notes and links where the full and real reportage is uh, on my timeline on Twitter and, you know, some other social media platforms as well. You'll you'll see them out there. They already exist. Then not not all these new ones that are popping up. We'll figure it out. Mastodon. I don't know. Tribal. I've been hearing some uh, some questionable things about. 
uh, post. Uh, take you, you, Wait in line. So we'll see. Anyway, if you would like to follow the show on Twitter while we still can, do so at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Alexandra Olson. Hundreds of journalists and other employees at the New York Times began a 24-hour walkout beginning yesterday, Thursday, the first strike of its kind at the newspaper in more than 40 years. Newsroom employees and other members of the News Guild of New York say they are fed up with bargaining that has dragged on since their last contract expired in March of 2021. The union announced last week that more than 1,100 employees would stage a 24-hour work stoppage beginning at 12.01 a.m. Thursday night, or Thursday, unless the two sides reach a contract deal. That was this morning. I have to keep remembering that would have been 9.01 p.m. uh, Wednesday night for us here on the West Coast. Now, the News Guild tweeted this morning that workers are now officially on work stoppage, the first of this scale at the company in four decades. It's never an easy decision to refuse to do work you love, but our members are willing to do what it takes to win a better newsroom for all. Negotiations took place Tuesday and some of yesterday Wednesday, but the signs remained far apart on issues including wage increases and remote work policies. On Wednesday evening last, the union said via Twitter that a deal had not been reached and the walkout was happening. We were ready to work for as long as it took to reach a fair deal, it said. But management walked away from the table with five hours to go. We know what we are worth, the union added. It was unclear how today's coverage would be affected, but the strike supporters include members of the fast-paced live news desk, which covers breaking news for the digital paper. Employees were planning a rally for this afternoon outside the newspaper's offices near Times Square. Blackus of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. The first ever U.S. auction of leases to develop commercial scale floating wind farms in the deep waters off the West Coast attracted $757 million in winning bids yesterday, Wednesday from mostly European companies in a project watched by other regions and countries just getting their own plans for floating offshore wind started. The auction featured five lease areas, two in Northern California and three in Central California, about 25 miles off the coast, that have the potential to generate 4.5 gigawatts of energy, enough for one and a half million homes. Combined, the lease areas cover 583 square miles of Pacific Ocean. The winning bids came from Norway's Equinor, California North Floating, part of Denmark's Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, Germany's RWEAG, and Central California Offshore Wind, a part of the French and Portuguese joint venture Ocean Winds. 
in uh, Invenergy was the only American company with a winning bid. Offshore wind is well established in the UK and some other countries, but it's just beginning to ramp up off America's coast. And this is the nation's first foray into floating wind turbines. U.S. auctions so far have been for those anchored to the seafloor. Ryan of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Google, Oracle, Microsoft, and Amazon will share in the Pentagon's $9 billion contract to build its cloud computing network a year after accusations of politicization over the previously announced contract and a protracted legal battle resulted in the military starting over in its award process. The Joint Warfighter Cloud capability is envisioned to provide access to unclassified, secret, and top-secret data to military personnel all over the globe. It is anticipated to serve as a backbone for the Pentagon's modern war operations, which will rely heavily on unmanned aircraft and space communication satellites, but we'll still need a way to go to quickly get the intelligence from those platforms to troops on the ground. The contract will be awarded in parts with a total estimated completion date of June of 2028, the Pentagon said in a statement. Competition is intense to snap up big corporate and government cloud contracts, Awards to build global computing networks where information is stored, shared, and secured over the Internet instead of on local computer systems. The Pentagon's award is seen as one of the most coveted because it is a stamp of approval in a market where ensuring a client's data security is important. Last July, the Pentagon announced it was canceling its previous cloud computing award then named Jedi. At the time, the Pentagon said that due to delays in proceeding with the contract, technology had changed to the extent that the old contract, which was awarded to Microsoft, no longer met the Department of Defense's needs. It did not mention the legal challenges behind those delays, which had come from Amazon, the losing bidder. Amazon had questioned whether Trump's administration had steered the contract toward Microsoft due to Trump's adversarial relationship with Amazon's chief executive officer at that time, Washington Post owner Jeff Bezos. All right, let us now get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, 
Hi, and welcome to COVID Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. This is your Fast Track update on the COVID pandemic. We bring you up to speed on the science behind the most urgent questions about the virus and the disease. We demystify the research and help you understand what it really means. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. And we're Scientific American senior health editors. Today, we're going to explain how vaccines help the economy. We saved $10 for every $1 we spent on them, plus millions of lives. And we'll talk about the protests in China against extreme lockdowns and the harm that the country's zero COVID policy is doing and how that could affect the rest of the world. COVID vaccines cost billions to develop and deliver. But for at least one big city that used them, they had an incredible rate of financial return. We usually talk about vaccines saving lives, but in New York City, hit hard by the pandemic early on, they saved the town from a gigantic economic hole too, Tanya. Vaccines saved the city about $28 billion, which is what it would have lost without the vaccines. Or as you said, every dollar spent on shots saved $10 that would have been spent without the shots. So Josh, where did the savings come from? A few different places, long hospitalizations that weren't needed, emergency room visits avoided, and workers who stayed healthy instead of calling in sick. Huh. But how did they know that things didn't happen? I mean, can you count those things? I wondered about that, too. It turns out scientists do know enough to build a model of events without vaccines. We know how effective the shots are at keeping people out of the hospital, and we have estimates of how many people in New York were infected. So from that, scientists can figure out how many infected New Yorkers would have been hospitalized if vaccines didn't exist. And there's data on numbers of unvaccinated people who turn up in emergency rooms versus vaccinated people. That makes sense. So what was the actual dollar figure? The direct costs of COVID-related health care, hospitals and such like, were about $7.5 billion with vaccines. Without them, the cost jumped to $33 billion. Costs like the value of lost workdays came to almost $2 billion with vaccination. Without it, the dollars lost due to lost productivity more than doubled to over $4 billion. The researchers reported this in a recent issue of the journal JAMA Network Open. But the vaccines themselves cost a lot for the city and federal governments to get and distribute. To be fair, that has to be accounted for, right? Right. It was almost $5 billion, including the money that the feds gave to the city for running the vaccine campaign and buying the actual shots. Now, the math of these calculations gets complicated, but at a basic level, New York spent that $5 billion and as a result, kept at least $28 billion. And that's not even including costs of the long business or school shutdowns that would have happened if vaccines weren't around. So yes, Vaccines save millions of lives, which are hard to put a value on, but they are also an incredibly strong return on investment. A wave of protests broke out in China last week against the government's strict zero COVID policies. Tanya, what do we know so far about what's happening there? Josh, the protests in China are some of the biggest in decades. They started last week after a fire in an apartment building in the western Chinese city of Urumqi. The fire resulted in an official death toll of 10 people, although it may have been much bigger. Some people have claimed that a COVID lockdown prevented people from escaping the building. So what happened next? How did these protests spread? People in other Chinese cities, including Shanghai and Beijing, organized vigils for the victims of the fire that quickly evolved into protests against the Chinese Communist Party's zero COVID policy. Some people have even called for Xi Jinping, the country's president, to step down. That seems like a big deal for China, a country that suppresses dissent and strictly controls people's speech. It's a huge deal, but let's back up a minute and talk about how zero COVID started. China began the policy when the outbreak first began in late 2019 in Wuhan. It's been very effective at stopping the virus's spread. China has had far fewer COVID cases and deaths, at least officially, than many other countries, especially for a country its size. So in some ways, you're saying their policy seems like a good thing. Well, it has been effective. At least that's how many Chinese people saw it at first. But we're almost three years into this pandemic now, and almost every other country has returned to something close to normal. Yet China has continued its draconian lockdowns and quarantine policies. 
and these have taken a huge economic and social toll, and the Chinese people just seem to have had enough. The Chinese government has reacted to the protests with arrests, but are they changing their policies in any way? Well, authorities have said they will relax some of their COVID policies, like no longer putting up gates to restrict access to apartment buildings where COVID cases have been detected, and reducing the amount of mass testing. But it is still committed to the goal of zero COVID. Is that even a feasible goal anymore, given the costs? I think many people would say it's not. The problem now is how to relax the restrictions without causing massive outbreaks and deaths. Because China has kept such a tight lid on COVID, relatively few people have immunity from infection. It's true that about 90% of the country is vaccinated, but China's Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines are less effective than Pfizer's and Moderna's mRNA vaccines. Plus, fewer people over 80 have gotten the shots, and only about 40% of that age group has gotten a booster. China is already reporting about 40,000 COVID cases per day. If it were to just let the virus rip, it could result in a million or more deaths. That sounds like a really terrible idea. It would be. And it's not just risky for China. If the government lets the virus run through such a large population, that could also lead to new variants that could circle the globe. And unchecked infections in China could also wreak havoc on the global economy. But it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Instead of lockdowns and mass testing, China could focus on vaccinating and boosting its elderly population, which it says it plans to do. It could give people mRNA vaccines for better protection, and it could ensure access to antiviral drugs like Paxlovid, which greatly lowered the risk of death. There's no easy way out of this, but it doesn't look like China will let go of zero COVID anytime soon. Now you're up to speed. Thanks for joining us. Our show is produced and edited by Jeff Del Vizio and Tulika Bose. It's December, and we're going to take a holiday break. We'll be back in 2023 with our own new variant of the show. Good one, Josh. So come back with us and check out Siam.com for updated and in-depth COVID news. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What did he balance on that big chair? Or... Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and N Family Fire. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution so donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1993. That was the day that President Bill Clinton signed the North American Free Trade Agreement into law. The stated aim of NAFTA was to increase trade between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It created the largest free trade zone in the world up until that time. President Clinton declared that NAFTA would promote more growth, more equality, better preservation of the environment, and a greater possibility for world peace. Many NAFTA supporters thought that the agreement would create hundreds of thousands of new high-wage U.S. jobs. They also claimed the agreement would raise living standards in the U.S., Mexico, and in Canada. Yet many in the labor movement were deeply skeptical of these claims. Labor organized against the bill, but despite the protests, Congress voted to pass the free trade agreement. In 2014, the 20th anniversary of NAFTA, the AFL-CIO released a report detailing the harm 
harmful impact of the trade agreement. It noted some alarming facts, stating, while the overall volume of trade within North America due to NAFTA has increased and corporate profits have skyrocketed, wages have remained stagnant in all three countries. It also found that productivity has increased, but workers' share of these gains has decreased steadily, along with unionization rates. Current data clearly shows the damage caused by NAFTA. Nevertheless, President Obama and many in Congress have pushed for the passage of a similar trade agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This agreement would simply expand the negative impacts of NAFTA. The TPP would lead to even lower wages and continued job loss. This agreement expands special protections for firms that send U.S. jobs out of the country. It is another in a long list of trade deals that have and will continue to hurt working people. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 36 degrees Fahrenheit, with uh, some rain showers falling right now at the moment. Uh, looks like we'll have highs in the low 40s, periods of rain throughout the day, winds light and variable, and we should be getting about three quarters of an inch of rain today. And then rain showers this evening, mixing with snow showers overnight. Lows in the upper 20s to low 30s. Winds will remain light and variable. And then a few showers in the morning, becoming a steady rain in the afternoon. Highs in the low 40s. Winds will pick up out of the southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And we should be getting about another quarter inch of rain tomorrow. They say that pollen is rated none right outside the window in Rogue River itself. And the air quality index for the region is in the moderate range at 65 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is in the low range at level 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.1 inches. Visibility is at 7 miles. And relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 37 degrees and fair. Paris is 38 and cloudy. Rome is 58 degrees and fair. Kiev is 30 and cloudy. Kabul is 41 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 65 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 46 degrees and fair. Sydney, Australia is 59 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 45 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 52 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Tong Wong of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. 
South Korea's government expanded its back-to-work orders today against thousands of cargo truck drivers who are staging a nationwide walkout over freight fare issues, saying a prolonged strike could inflict deep scars on the country's economy. The work start orders on steel and fuel truckers were inevitable because the strike could begin to hurt major export industries like automobiles and shipbuilding. If it extends further, Finance Minister Chu Kyung-ho said in a news conference, the strike's impact has so far been mostly limited to domestic industries like construction. The orders, which were initially issued on November 29th on some 2,500 cement truckers, were expanded to about 6,000 drivers transporting steel and 4,500 transporting fuel and chemicals. Police are also clamping down on unionists who threaten or disrupt colleagues who choose to work. The widening of the orders came even as the strike's impact was diminishing entering its third week with container traffic at the country's major ports recovering pre-strike levels and cement supplies resuming at construction sites. The conservative government of President Yuk suk Yol has taken aggressive steps to ease delays in industrial shipments, such as mobilizing nearly 200 military vehicles, including containers and fuel trucks. Strikers, represented by the Cargo Truckers Solidarity Union, walked out on November 24th demanding the government make permanent a minimum freight rate system that is set to expire at the end of 2022, which they say is crucial for safety and financial stability in the face of rising fuel costs. While the minimum fares currently apply only to shipping containers and cement, the strikers are also calling for the benefits to be expanded to other cargo, including oil and chemical tankers, steel and automobile carriers, and package delivery trucks. Yoon's government had offered to expand the current scheme for another three years, but has so far rejected calls to widen the scope of minimum rates. The orders have marked the first time in any South Korean government has exercised contentious powers based on a law revised in 2004 that says failure to comply without justifiable reason is punishable by up to three years in jail or a maximum fine of $22,800 U.S. Critics say the law infringes on constitutional rights because it does not clearly spell out what would qualify as acceptable conditions for a strike. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Greece's foreign ministry has slammed what it called Turkish threats of war after the Turkish foreign minister threatened to take action against Greece in the wake of a military exercise in the Aegean Sea. In a statement issued yesterday, Wednesday, the foreign ministry said that Turkey's repeated threats of war were completely unacceptable and noted that Greece respects international law and the United Nations law of the sea. On Tuesday, Turkish Foreign Minister Melvut Kavosuglu said that Greece needs to renounce its violation. Either it steps back on the issue and abides by the agreement, or we will do whatever is necessary. 
NATO members Turkey and Greece have decades-old disputes over an array of issues, including territorial claims in the Aegean Sea and disputes over the airspace there. The disputes have brought them to the brink of war three times in the past 50 years. Tensions have mounted in recent years, particularly over exploratory drilling rights in areas of the Mediterranean Sea, where Greece and Cyprus claim exclusive economic zones, culminating in a naval standoff two years ago. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver